I can't wait to tell people that I spent so much time with the folks at uh, Purpose Driven Communities and tell them when they ask, well, how were they? And I say, they all think they're such a big deal. <laughs> I have to tell you, uh, I'm a little bit concerned at how this is gonna go. Uh, when I woke up this morning, you know, I live here in Charlotte. Woke up this morning, hopped out of the shower, put my suit on, and I was really raring to go and really excited uh, about this opportunity. And my wife kind of looked at me and said, uh, what's, gotten, what's gotten into you? And I said, well, today's the day that I get to speak uh, in front of the, the group uh, at the Marriott, the Purpose Driven Communities and uh, purpose-built communities. My, my wife says, uh, and I, I said, did you ever in your wildest dreams think I would get this kind of opportunity? And she said, Jay, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was kind of a low blow, and so my ego took a hit, and I thought for a second, maybe I'm not a big deal. And came here today, I was coming up the escalator, and somebody kind of does a double take, a gentleman does a double take and stops me and says, uh, anybody ever tell you you look like Jay Billis? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, sir, that, uh, that happens to me all the time. And, uh, and he said, well, that must really piss you off. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm working from a deficit here, <laughs> but I will do the best that I can. Uh, I know most of you are not from this area, you're from other places uh, and have come to Charlotte. I hope you're enjoying uh, the Queen City, it's a great place to live. I've been here 22 years. Uh, but having gone to, to Duke uh, and played for Coach K, um, thank you for holding your applause on that. <laughs> this, is a, this is a big University of North Carolina area. And uh, how many of you went to North Carolina? Okay, quite a few. Um, I'm pretty popular at the University of North Carolina, frankly. Uh, and I think it's because I sucked as a player. And they really didn't sweat me that much. Uh, I think most Carolina fans look at me as being as responsible for Carolina wins over Duke as Michael Jordan was. But I was, when I was flying home uh, yesterday, I was in San Antonio uh, for a few days, and I was flying home and I happened to sit I was at a Duke event, and I, I had been there with Christian Leitner and, uh, and Elton Brand. And we were flying back, and there was a Carolina fan sitting right across the aisle from us, dressed in all light blue. And Carolina this, Carolina the Carolina hat. And the guy reached across the aisle and, and hits me on the shoulder and says, hey, you want to hear a Duke joke? So I'm sitting next to Elton Brand, Leitner's in the seat in front, and I said, well, sir, uh, you got about, you know, 20 feet and 700 pounds of Duke graduate here. You still want to tell your Duke joke? And he says, nah, I don't want to have to explain it three times. <laughs> I, uh, Everybody's very kind to talk about this, this book that I wrote, uh, Toughness, and I'm told that some of you are going to get a copy of it, so it's, a, it's great for, uh, it can be used as a doorstop, you can set a fire with it, kill a small rodent, and then, you know, you look up and you see, okay, you see, like, they refer to me as, uh, as attorney, analyst, uh, athlete, actor, and when my wife hears that, she always says, they're leaving out an A word. Uh, but most of, what, most of what I learned about, about toughness and teamwork, I learned in college. And I learned playing basketball for Coach K. When you think about as we grow up, you know, who taught us to be a great teammate? And who taught us to be a great colleague and a great classmate in school? It's something maybe we learned by osmosis. Maybe we had a great teacher. Maybe we had a great coach, great family that would help us with that. But it, it, at least when I was growing up, I didn't feel like it was something that was emphasized and explained and defined. I learned it in college. Now, I got, I got lessons from my family in it, from my dad and my mom, individual lessons that I, that I learned from. But it really all came together when I started playing in college and when I started playing for Coach K. And I want to tell you a little story that happened after college that I think applies 
to what, what's going on here and what you are doing. Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately. You know, my former coach, Mike Krzyzewski, has been the coach of the United States national team, has coached uh, all the pros in the Olympics. And a few years ago, I sat in on a presentation that he was giving uh, about how he wanted to get everybody together to understand what it meant to compete with USA across your chest. And he said something that was really profound in explaining it. He said, you know, if you're a coach or a leader, you can't just tell your people something. You have to make them feel it. And he started talking about what it meant. I can't just explain what it means. We've got to make them feel it. So he took his team to Arlington National Cemetery, and they watched and were, were, were right there for the burial of a soldier uh, that had fallen overseas. He didn't have to explain anything. They knew what it meant. They knew what selfless service meant, what USA meant. He also showed some videos that he put together for the team. He had his staff put together. And they were really amazing. And he talked about the fact that most of the players, they're, they're playing for, they may be playing for the Los Angeles Lakers or the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Houston Rockets. He says they don't have a fight song for those teams. You know, they had a fight song when they were in, when they were in college. You know, Duke and North Carolina and UCLA, they have a, Notre Dame, they have their fight songs. Well, he, he started talking about, here's our fight song. And he played the national anthem that was uh, sung by Marvin Gaye at the 1984 All-Star Game. Over it was images of the players playing the way he wanted them to play uh, in their USA jerseys all the interactions he wanted them to have as a team. Really powerful, really powerful. And it gave you an incredible feeling. Afterwards, he said, made the point that, you know, these videos are not motivational. They're not motivational. These guys are motivated. These videos are inspirational. And you started thinking about the difference in that. The, the work that you are doing out in your communities, you're motivated. The people you are dealing with are motivated. But they still, everybody still needs to be inspired because the goal and the destination that you've got is it's a long slog. It is not easy. It is not going to be solved. The problems are not going to be solved uh, by one thing, by throwing money in a certain area, by having a certain event, uh, by building one thing. It's a, it's a, it's a team effort that is going to take some time. And, you know, I, I thought about something that I learned when I was writing the book. I, I, had, I had reached out. It started being this toughness thing started as a basketball concept. I had watched a game, and I saw a commentator. I heard a commentator, much like me, that was praising a player for being tough, and I thought that player was just acting like a bully, that that's not what real toughness is. It motivated me and inspired me to write an article about what I thought toughness was in basketball. The article got more attention and response than I could have possibly imagined. Literally all over the world, people were reaching out to me uh, about it. Uh, military people, teachers, uh, uh, professional people, coaches from all walks, all sports, you name it. It was really amazing. It led me to believe that there was an appetite for more, but it, it ha I thought it had to be outside of basketball. And one of the people I reached out to was a friend of mine named Dr. Henry Friedman. He, uh, is, he, he's the director of the Duke Brain Tumor Center in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Henry's an amazing human being. Uh, he, he deals with situations where his, the vast majority of his patients don't survive. And he is the most positive, hopeful person I've ever met. I wanted to talk to him about the, uh, what toughness meant to him. Because having to deal with what he deals with every day takes a tremendous amount, in my view, of toughness. And his answer to me was far different than I expected. I expected somehow to, to hear that he was uh, so driven by uh, the outcome that he ignored the difficulties or he had to shut things off and have a have a you know single-minded and purpose 
and he said something that, that really blew me away. They, he said the foundation of toughness is hope. You say that to an athlete or a coach, and most of them will respond by saying, hope's not a plan. That's what we say, hope's not a plan. You know, or Mike Tyson saying, everybody's got a plan until they get hit, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> But he, 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 said, he said, now stick with me on this. He said, he said, I'm not talking about going without a plan. But when you put your plan together, you've got the hope and the belief that it's going to be successful, that you've got the ability to accomplish your objective. Hope. That's what he sells. That's what he deals with. That's the foundation of everything he does. And he said, I'm going to give you the name of a person that I want you to, I want you to call and, and get together with and it's gonna change your life. I'm starting to get emotional about this. Um, and he did. He told me about this woman named Sabrina Lewandowski. She's not tall enough to see over this podium. Uh, third grade teacher in the Triangle area. Unbelievable human being. She was diagnosed several years ago with a, uh, uh, a brain tumor, glioblastoma. The survival rate is 9%. When she was diagnosed, Henry uh, was her doctor, brought her in and said, basically gave her the hope that you are going to survive this. We ha and, and to he asked her, what do you know about glioblastoma? After she, this, is, this is a period of time after she had been diagnosed. And she said, well, really not very much. And he said, well, don't go on the internet, don't research it, don't look it up, because all it's gonna tell you is you're gonna be dead in six months. And that's not going to happen. He, he, he got her to believe, and her inner strength believed, that's, that nine, I'm the 9%. The 91%, that's not me. I'm the 9%. And he, he says, we're going to have a plan A. If plan A doesn't work, we're going to go to plan B. And if plan B doesn't work, we're going to go to plan C. And talked about all the technological developments that are happening right now, and the goal the objective is we are going to keep you alive until we've got the ability to overcome this. Aside from telling her family, Sabrina told me that the, the hardest thing that she had to deal with was going in for treatment. And she would go in for treatment and have to walk past other patients who were dealing with the same or similar things that she would look, she would look their way and see they're not going to make it. And she said, the hardest thing for me to do was turn away from that and convince myself, that's not me. She kept hope and was tough enough to say, that's not me. And Henry was tough with her. After she had her radical surgery, her husband drove her to the hospital. When they got to the, to the door, there were all these wheelchairs. Uh, Sabrina didn't, didn't know how to handle it. So she sat in one of them, and her husband pushed her into the office. When Henry saw her, he said, I operated, I did brain surgery on you. What's wrong with your legs? <laughs> Get up. And she now it, has had a baby, moved on, got a great life. That, to me, is all, you know, all I needed to know. Any, you know, I talked to football players, soccer players, basketball players, you name it, uh, NASA engineers for this book, soldiers. Sabrina Lewandowski was the toughest person I dealt with, and it wasn't close. It wasn't close. I'll tell you that I think that, that the foundation of, of toughness, the foundation for all the things that we've taught, perseverance, sticking with it, all that stuff, is hope. There is hope for a solution for all of the issues we're facing. The only way that we're going to overcome these issues is by doing it together. Because that's another part of this. You know, one, one of the things my coach, Coach K, has, and he's still my coach, 30 years later he's still my coach, what he's imparted on me is nobody's tough alone. You're not born tough, it's not, you're not tough alone. 
and nobody accomplishes anything worthwhile by themselves. One of the, you know, an amazing thing I took from him when talking about being a teammate was the idea of be the teammate you want to play with. It's on you to be that teammate first. I, uh, I want to commend you for the work that you're doing. I'm in awe of all of you. Um, it, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, you are a big deal. And I feel like a much bigger deal that I've been, I've been with you. And I want to thank you for having me. And I think, I think uh, they wanted me to open it up for questions. So if any of you have any questions, like why is a big guy like you crying in front of people? <laughs> the pollen in this room is embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, but if you, uh, if you have any questions, whether it's about is your team going to be any good or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, the question is, uh, what, I know I've been following your writing with, about the NCAA and, and kind of reforming um, you know, the way things work in, in a lot of instances. And then it strikes me that ESPN as a huge corporation uh, might be interested in some of this work because if customers can't afford cable, then they can't uh, see your product. And, you know, would you, do you think if there, there is an appetite for that uh, among kind of the, the, the bigger institutions in this country? Well, let's talk about that. Whatever help I can be, I would, li I would like to do that. And uh, so if I, can, if I can get this issue in front of my bosses, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, because we're, you know, if it's not, if we can't do it for the right reason, you know, because it's right, getting more subscribers is good. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike, I've studied Coach K. Uh, anybody who's been that successful in anything uh, deserves to be studied. Um, and one thing I've always wondered was whether or not he, he had a larger advantage in terms of attracting talent, or did he have a better skill at increasing the level of talent, bringing talent out of a set group? You see what I'm saying? I do. I, I think it's both. You know, he, Coach K gets great players as evidenced here. <laughs> uh, so he's not working with, with the raw material that isn't, isn't quality. But what, what I think he does is he's able to bring out the best of your individual talents and, and get them blended together with the individual talents of other players so that five are acting as one out on the court. And w one of the metaphors he used to use with us was a fist, I think he still uses it today, w was the metaphor of a fist. And basically said, if you want to have power behind what you're doing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go at something like this, where you have five individual things. You'd go like that. That's where your power would come from. So five together can accomplish more than five individually. And I think getting players to believe in each other, and it's not always easy. And the reason, I can tell you the reason I went to play for him. Uh, this wouldn't fit the NCAA's narrative that you choose a school for the school's sake and basketball is just a secondary concern. I did not have a good experience in high school. I was, a, I was, a high, I was one of the top players in the country and, uh, and my high school coach was not a good one. And that was unfortunate for me, but it was more unfortunate for my teammates that didn't go on to play after high school. That was their last experience in the game was having to deal with that. And I decided that the only time in my basketball career that I got to choose who I played for is when I go to college. And I was going to choose the right person. So I trusted that the right person was going to be at the right school. So I really didn't choose a school. I chose a, a coach. And I came down to Coach K, Jim Beheim, and Lute Olson, uh, all three of whom are in the Basketball Hall of Fame now. Now, Coach K claims he would have gotten in earlier if I'd selected one of the other two. <laughs> But I trusted him from, from the first day. And this was back when he'd never, my first NCAA tournament game was his first. He had no track record. And uh, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of the decision I made. 
but uh, I think the thing that I hear about him most often, you'll hear people in, in praise of him say, you know what, he's the same person now that he was then, and they mean it as a compliment. And I differ with that. He's way different. He's way better. He's way better now than he was then. And, and could you just, as a follow-up, could you confirm or comment on the idea that, because uh, I'm interested in the management style, some managements tell others what to do, and some managements encourage others to make their own decisions. And I'm curious as to how that worked uh, with Coach K, whether you were told to do certain things or rather encouraged to make those decisions and whether there was that sense of empowerment that made a, a real difference. That's a good question. It's both. Uh, you know, when I was taken out of a game, uh, he, he, uh, he encouraged me to grab more rebounds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I, I think the word I would use with Coach K would be freedom. Right. That, that uh, you are required to do certain things, but, and you have a role. And your role isn't necessarily who you are. It's what the team needs you to do to win a championship. And th that's, a big, that's a big distinction. That if somebody, because most people when they hear role and role player, they think limited. They're trying to limit me. And that's not what it is. You know, you can't have everybody be the leading scorer. You can't have everybody take the most shots. You can't ever, you know, not everybody can guard the other team's best player. Uh, there have got to be roles defined. And every role is equally important. It's not the same role, but it's equally important. And the fact that the media or fans don't see that, that's their problem. That has nothing to do with internally what we do. Uh, but he gives you the freedom uh, to break out of those roles when it's required and to, to play instinctively. Right. And that's a, so it's a balance of the two. And, uh, and he's, he can be, he's incredibly demanding. Uh, there were times when he would raise his voice, um, but was, he was, Tony Dungy said this, and I think it's a great way, he's demanding without being demeaning. You know, never, never once was he demeaning. Uh, there were times when it felt that way, but it, that's not the way it was. Uh, but you knew, when you made a mistake, you knew he was in the room. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> no pressure. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and I wonder if you noticed that the Royals won their first playoff game in 29 years last night. <laughs> I did notice. I actually played high school basketball against Brett Saberhagen. Oh, really? Yeah. One of our former pitchers. That's not the real question. <laughs> so I make sure everyone knew. Um, you've, I've, you've said a couple or more things about toughness, that hope is at the basis of toughness. Uh, no one is tough alone. Could you give us another tidbit or two about toughness? Sure. Um, you know, for me, a lot of it had to do with overcoming barriers that I thought I had that I really didn't have to, uh, to go past limits. You know, whether you're a, an athlete, uh, a lawyer, whatever, we all have these perceived barriers and perceived limits. Am I good enough to do this? You know, it, it, it used to be that public speaking was a, was a barrier for me. And when you put yourself in a position of having to break through those barriers and push through those limits, you'll find that they don't really exist where you think they exist. And it, it, I think it's easy, easier for people to relate to uh, sort of an athletic example. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm friendly with Mia Hamm, who played, uh, played soccer uh, at North Carolina and one of the great athletes of our time uh, with USA Soccer. And both she and Julie Foudy told me this story about when they were training, that in, in their fitness training, they would come up to the limit of exhaustion and think, boy, this is make or break here. Uh, it's, we're either gonna push through this or we're gonna quit. And oftentimes, athletes quit. You know, you don't like to say it, but that's oftentimes the result. And one of their teammates uh, started, when they got to that point, started essentially screaming and said their biggest competitor at the time was Norway. And her, her screams were, Norway's not effing doing this right now, let's go. And they pushed through to a new limit and that would not have happened if not for somebody speaking up and saying, let's go. 
And one of the things Julie Foudy said was, everybody, you know, everybody's got it. There, somebody has it every day. It may not be you. You know, maybe you've got a, maybe you've got a, uh, you're having a bad day, you don't feel well, or you, you don't have your A game. Somebody has on your team has their A game that day. It's their responsibility to drag the rest of the group to the A level. You know, that, that's uh, pretty powerful. And that's where, you know, you're not doing it alone. Be the teammate you want to play with. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, my, uh, my junior year in college, we used to have to run the mile every year as, I thought it was punishment, but apparently it was training. Um, we asked, you used to have to run it for time. And I do not like running for no reason. If, I, if I'm being chased, I run. Or if there's a ball involved and there's a score being kept, I'll run. But if somebody says, hey, you want to go for a run, I'd, there'd better be a gun to my head. So I wanted to improve my mile time. And you know I'd done fine my first two years, but fine wasn't good, and I wanted to do better. And I really trained my tail off. I trained really hard for it. My roommate, same size as me, he would argue he's a much better athlete. I don't think so. Uh, didn't train like I did. When it came time to run the mile for time, he dominated me. I ran my best time ever, but he ran a lot faster. And I was pissed. And I said to him afterwards, like, how is that possible? Like, you ran, you know, I was thinking, have you been running at night or what did you do? And, and he said something really I thought was pretty, he said, look, all the mile is, is how much pain you're willing to endure for four laps. That's all it is. And boom. I wasn't willing to endure the same amount of pain he was. I was running. I was training to, make the mi to improve my mile time, but to do it more comfortably. That's not the right way. That was a, a, a great lesson for me. I'm not trying to be comfortable. I'm trying to be more productive. So I needed to be in more pain. And that was a, that was a big deal. I'm still pissed at him about that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for having me.